Hello folks and welcome to my series of lectures on the cell. Cells are the smallest basic unit of life. There's nothing smaller than a cell that's considered alive. And understanding how a cell works creates the foundation for understanding how all life works. The first concept I'd like us to tackle is small cell size. Have you ever wondered why cells are so small? Me either, until I was asked this question too many years ago. It turns out cell size has an enormous impact on their biology. There is a very important reason why cells are small. It has to do with the efficiency at which materials move in and out of the cells themselves. How big are cells anyway? Here's a scale of relative sizes to give you a hint. Starting off on the right here, you see an adult female or an adult human. We would measure people using the metric scale in the order of meters. A, a regular chicken egg on the order of centimeters or meters. A frog egg, which you can still see with the naked eye in the, in the order of millimeters. But when you get down to cells, you're looking at micrometers. A micrometer is a millionth of a meter. Bacteria are even smaller. Organic molecules of life, like proteins and lipids, getting even smaller in the order of nanometers. Those are billionths of a meter. With atoms, we're talking about units even smaller than nanometers. Picometers, which is a trillionth of a meter. Quite small. You can see here, all of those things that you can't see with the naked eye, you can see with a, with a light microscope. And that's what we have in class, and you'll be able to see that. In fact, you probably already have. This is a neat flash tool, and it's cool to play with, too. You can access it by typing in the address above. Let me show you how it works. In the window here, up in the left-hand corner, you see a tiny little square that measures one millimeter by one millimeter. In relation, here's a coffee bean. You would measure a coffee bean in the order of millimeters. It measures about 12 millimeters long and about 8 millimeters wide. A grain of rice, 8 millimeters by 2, two and a half millimeters. If we take this scrub bar here and scroll across, we start to see the relative sizes of other things that are common to you. A sesame seed, 3 by 2 millimeters. A grain of salt, half a millimeter across. Amoeba is a large single-celled organism, about 500 micrometers across. Paramecium is a little bit smaller, 210 by 60 micrometers. Here we go, skin cell, 30 micrometers across. A blood cell, even smaller still, 8 micrometers across. A chromosome, 7 micrometers. Here come the bacteria. E. coli, a common bacteria in your gut, 3 micrometers long. A lysosome, an organelle in your cells, one micrometer. Mitochondria, four micrometers. Here come the viruses at 130 nanometers. That's billionths of a meter across. The hepatitis virus, 45 nanometers. Getting smaller still, the hemoglobin molecule, which is a relatively large protein, six and a half nanometers across. Then we start getting really small all the way down to the carbon atom which is about 340 picometers across. That's a trillionth of a meter, one picometer. Well, that's kind of cool, but I digress. It all has to do with the cell's surface area and its volume. The surface area is where a cell exchanges its materials with its environment. Cell products, such as wastes, nutrients, ga and gases, must pass through the cell surface first. The volume of the cell is the living part, and that creates a demand for these materials. As the volume grows, so does the need to move more material. And herein lies the mathematical problem that impacts the, the cell's metabolism. Both surface area and volume grow with the cell, but gr volume grows faster. Let me show you how. Here's the mathematical relationship between the surface area and the volume of a three-dimensional object. The letter N represents the measurement of one of the sides. To keep it simple, we'll use a cube. I'm assuming you know that the surface area of a square is length times width. That's two dimensions. And a cube has six sides. And the volume is length times width times height. That's three dimensions, or cubed. Now let's use some numbers. If the length of the cube you see is two units, we plug that in for n and get 24 over 8. 
That's a ratio of surface area to volume of 3 to 1. The surface area is 3 times larger than the volume. If we double the size of the block, plug in 4 for the linear measurement of one of the sides of the cube, well then that gives us a ratio of 96 to 64, or reduced to 1 half to 1. Notice, notice what's happened to the surface area to volume ratio. They're getting closer together or smaller. If we increase the size of the block even more, we get a one-to-one -one ratio of surface area to volume. And then at some point, the volume overtakes the size of the surface area. The cell cannot get the materials it needs in or out of the cell at an efficient rate for the cell to do its job. Here's just another representative model of how it works. On the left, you see the radii of three different cells. And as the cell grows, the linear measurement of the radius grows proportionately. But the surface area and the volume do not. The surface area grows faster than the linear measurement, but the volume grows even faster. At some point, the volume, or the living part of the cell, can't get the materials it needs in or out of it at an efficient rate for the cell to do its job. So instead of growing big, cells stay small. The skin cells of a mouse are about the same size as the skin cells of an elephant. Large organisms are just made up of more cells, that's all. Cells do have strategies for increasing their surface area as they grow. As you see here, in this figure, up in the left-hand corner here, we have red blood cells. They're relatively small as cells, but if you saw them on the side, they'd be disc-shaped. And the center of the disc is sort of indented a little bit to increase the surface area of the cell. Red blood cells need an awful lot of surface area to absorb all of the oxygen that, oxygen that they do at the lungs and, and to be able to supply the demand of all the other cells in the body. Figure B are muscle cells. Muscle cells can be extremely long, but they're also very thin. That increases their surface area. Figure C is showing a typical neuron or nerve cell. Nerve cells have long, thin projections that increase their surface area. Other strategies for plant cells, which have relatively large cells, they, they decrease their functional volume by creating a large internal organelle called a central vacuole. The vacuole is non-living material and doesn't require anything but water. So in reality, the functional volume of the cell is relatively small. Where else do we see this problem of surface area to volume ratio being solved? Well, if you're an aquatic organism, you're very small and flat, like this planaria, flatworm. You're small enough and flat enough to allow the diffusion of gases into and out of your body at an efficient rate. Fish need to absorb an awful lot of oxygen through their gills. If you examine gills closely, you see that there are lots of little finger-like projections that increase the surface, surface area of the gills and allow them to absorb lots of oxygen in the relatively low oxygen environment of water. Your lungs have a surface area of a roughly 70 square meters if you flattened out all the surface area on the, on the inside. That's about half of a tennis court. Your small intestine has a surface area of about 250 square meters. That's a whole tennis court. All of the surface areas increase the rate at which materials pass in and out of the cells. Well, I hope that was helpful. If you've got any questions, please write them down and bring them to class, and we'll discuss them there. Until then, 